Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Jesse Sanders of Aquatic Veterinary Services, and I'm coming to you today to speak about fish surgery. So just a little note before we start, uh, there is a tiny question box on the side of your little um, sidebar there. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please go ahead and put them in there. I will answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, it will take me a little bit of time. It's a, unfortunately a very small box on my side. So I will do the best I can and make sure that everything is answered. So starting out with fish surgery. So for those of you who are not familiar with me or what I do, I am the owner and chief veterinarian at Aquatic Veterinary Services. We are 100% mobile aquatic veterinary practice serving both California and Nevada. We have over 500 clients and those are primarily uh, betta, cichlid, goldfish, saltwater, and koi. I am five and a half years in practice at this organization. I'm also on the board of the American Association of Fish Veterinarians and the private practice chair of the Aquatic Veterinary Medicine Committee of the National Veterinary Medical Association. I received my bachelor's in marine biology from the University of Rhode Island and my DVM from Tufts University in Massachusetts. So before we start, just please keep in mind that everything that is going to be discussed today needs to be performed by a licensed and trained veterinarian. This lecture is not a how-to manual. If you are a veterinarian and would like more training on how to do surgery and other aquatic veterinary medicine uh, issues, please look into the American Association of Fish Veterinarians or the World Aquatic Veterinary Medical Association. So starting off, why do fish need surgery? Why is this even an issue that we have to discuss today? Well, there are many instances in where surgery can greatly benefit a fish's welfare and its quality of life. So for any of you that follow us fairly regularly, you have probably heard of lemon. Lemon is a fancy goldfish of the Oranda variety. And she unfortunately was adopted with a bit of an oral deformity. Well, over time, this oral deformity became so bad that she actually fractured or luxated the right side of her jaw there. So she did require surgery in order to be able to correct that. This koi here, you can see, has a very severe ocular tumor. Um, now, we'll discuss this later. We'll be going over ocular tumors in particular. But when a fish is swimming, usually it's not the tumor itself that's causing the problem. As they're swimming, they can feel the drag and pull of that tumor as they swim through the water, and it becomes very obnoxious, very problematic for them. So they will try to remove it themselves by flashing and trying to itch whatever it is on the side of their head off. Well, obviously, if this is a tumor, it's not going to come off and can actually cause severe neurologic trauma from that just kind of practice of trying to get it off themselves. Again, you, some of you may be familiar with Rocky. Rocky is a shovel-nosed catfish, a naughty little fish who decided to eat a pound of the substrate that was at the bottom of his tank. We don't really know why he did this, but obviously with a belly full of rocks, you're gonna need surgery in order to get them out. Sparky is a little comet goldfish, and again, another one of these ocular tumors. You can see in this case, how severe this tumor has grown, it's almost the same size as his head. So again, it's gonna cause him problems swimming and certainly problems while he's trying to maintain homeostasis and be able to stay upright. And another koi, this one uh, fortunately had a gonadal sarcoma, so we weren't really able to help him too much, but these tumors can be very tricky because again, this fish just, you know, looks maybe a little bit chubby. And again, it's up to the owners to really notice when, say, you have a pregnant female that's just still pregnant, you have a fish that just has a very uh, high body condition score and looks fat a lot. It's very easy for us to determine tumors from, say, regular reproductive structures and just internal fat with an ultrasound. 
So we're doing a lot more diagnostics on these guys and being able to catch them a lot sooner. And again, with these fancy orandas, they have this lovely wen on top of their head. And for the majority, they never tend to grow too much out of control. But again, some of these wens just kind of get away from the little fish and it causes them to have problems seeing, eating, and at their worst will actually cause them to be upside down on the bottom of their tank because they're just so heavy. So through surgery, we are able to correct a lot of these issues that these fish are having. So how do fish undergo surgery? I'm sure many of you have either had surgery yourself, you've had family members go through surgery, or maybe even a pet. So obviously, for most of these fish, if not all of them, you're going to require anesthesia. And this is going to be required for any surgical procedure that we do. There are many different options that are available for veterinarians. My personal drug of choice is tricane methane sulfonate, also known as MS222. It is the only drug that is approved by the FDA for use in food fish. I primarily use it because it is always manufactured exactly the same, and the fish have quick induction and a relatively quick recovery. Eugenol is used by a lot of hobbyists. However, keep in mind that not all formulations of this are made the same. Um, there are YouTube videos where you can learn how to make your own, and unfortunately, this is not controlled by anyone anywhere. The control form of this is isoeugenol, which is the acquiesce there that you can see in the tub. This is out of a company in uh, Washington known as Aquatactics. Another fish veterinarian actually owns this company. Metomidate hydrochloride, also known as Aquacom, um, unfortunately, it doesn't really reach anesthetic levels for surgical procedures. So it will calm your fish down a little bit. It's not going to put them in a anesthetic plane. Propofol will work. Uh, you have to use it as a secondary method because it has to be given IV. Isofluorine can be bubbled into the water and works on fish, very similarly to people and dogs and cats. However, you have to keep in mind that Anyone standing over the tank where the isofluorine is bubbling through can obviously become susceptible to it. So you have to make sure that you're doing this in a well-ventilated area or all your staff will be on the floor. So then how do we get this to the fish? Well, obviously we need to have a system that is recirculating or else we're just going to go through a lot of drugs. We need to include aeration. Because, again, fish need oxygen, and especially if they're being ventilated or not breathing well, we have to make sure that they're still able to get oxygen to the, through their blood. And we have to be able to manipulate the anesthetic depth. So when a fish or a dog or a cat or a person is placed under anesthesia, there are many different planes that we can, levels of anesthesia that we can be at. So certainly you might just be a little drowsy, but... You might not feel that needle stick when the anesthesiologist is coming over, but certainly if you go too deep into anesthesia, you could potentially die. So you have to be able to manipulate it using your anesthetic delivery system. Now what we have has been custom made for us. It's very portable. It is a little acrylic V that sits over a 10 gallon aquarium, and this can go with us anywhere. You can see the fish would be usually up in the top, either on a dorsal or ventral presentation. It has a tube that runs from the reservoir with the water containing our anesthetic solution up that tube into the fish's mouth and then over the gills. So essentially, this is acting as a respirator for the fish. We can turn that V and invert it, put it upside down, and use some bubble wrap to make custom padding for our little tiny fish friends or a fish that needs to be in a lateral presentation. You can see even with our tiny, tiny fish there, like this is lemon, we have some airline tubing at her mouth that even that was just a little bit too big for her. And with this, we can't use an aquarium pump since she's so small, so we had a, a syringe that was pumping water through, and we actually had somebody whose job it was to just fill the syringes. So if you want any more information on this, um, Dr. Lubart and Harms out of NC State have basically written the paper on anesthetic delivery systems. However, they have one that's custom made to a big rolling cart, which for us isn't practical because we do this as a mobile setup. 
So like I said, the anesthetic depth will vary depending on the individual patient, their species, and the concentration of the drug in the water. Some of these lighter stages we will use for general exams, drawing blood, doing our fin and gill clips, but our surgical anesthesia is very important to be maintained through surgical procedures, because obviously we don't want a fish that's going to feel what we're doing or start wiggling and wake up mid-procedure. As you can see, right under surgical anesthesia is unfortunately medullary collapse. So if a fish gets too deep, they could have the potential that they could die during the procedure. So how do we monitor anesthetic depth? Well, there's a couple visual keys we can use. And that is a percular movement, lack of the writing reflex, if a fish is on their side or upside down and don't seem to care very much, and they may be insensitive to pain and noxious stimuli. So again, all of our patients are gonna be getting their pre-op meds. We might need to pull a couple scales to prep our field. So if they're not responding to that, we know that they're at a pretty good plane of anesthesia. Some more technological and advanced options we can use are ECGs. Usually with this, uh, you're not gonna see the standard QR uh, PQRST waves that you'd see in small animals and humans because fish only have two chambers in their heart, not four. So with this, we can actually insert needles right next to where their heart is in their body and clamp the leads onto that. We can use ultrasound, again, to watch the heartbeat at periods during the procedure, and you can see us using it there. This is our portable system. It actually has a Doppler flow where we can see um, fluid rushing either forward or backwards if it is blue or red. You can use Doppler. This is that whoosh, whoosh, whoosh noise that you sometimes associate with ultrasounds. We can put this on the heart and hear the blood rushing through the heart. And you can use a pulse oximeter. So this will measure the oxygen concentration of the blood. And usually it clips onto your finger if you've ever been to the doctor's office. In some larger fish, we can actually clip this to their fins and get the same readings. So fish analgesia is a must for all surgical procedures, preventing them from feeling pain. Um, there are a couple options that require a DEA license, and there are others that are not DEA licensed. You have to make sure that you consider pain management for both the short term during the procedure and the recovery period after surgery. The surgical technique for fish is extremely similar to small animals. The one thing that is really different is when we prep our surgical field, fish have that mucus coat on them, which is very beneficial. It contains a lot of um, macrophages and antibodies and great immune function. So we want to maintain it as much as possible. So rather than doing a very intense scrub with betadine or chlorhexidine. You might just do a very simple swab with sterile saline or betadine just to get some of the bacteria off there. And again, if they're a larger fish, I will need to pull the scales in order to get a scalpel through their skin. There's always the question of do you use absorbable or non-absorbable suture? Well, for all these absorbable two sutures, they're made for small animals with an internal temperature up near 99, 100 degrees. And our patients are never gonna get that warm. So unfortunately, the absorbable suture is going to act almost identically to the non-absorbable suture, at least in the sh few short weeks to months. Um, certainly, if we are doing an internal procedure, we will use the absorbable suture, and it will just take a considerably longer amount of time for that to be absorbed by the body. So certainly, before we even consider surgery, we want to consider the environment and make sure that these fish are going to be in a low stress environment coming out of surgery. So how do we minimize stress? Well, certainly, hopefully you've heard before me mention water quality. Water quality is the most important factor that plays into fish health. And you as owners, it is one of the key factors that can influence how good your water quality is. So good water quality, will certainly decrease the stress for a fish that's undergoing a surgical procedure. Is your system overcrowded? So again, 
it's going to stress out your fish if there's just no room to swim, if there's competition for food, if they're getting picked on by bigger fish. Proper nutrition. We have our nutrition webinar that hopefully you've watched before. But certainly a fish that is not eating is going to be extremely stressed out of surgery because it's not going to have any energy to heal properly and just make all their issues that much more difficult. And then is the fish going to recover at home in their home tank or pond or in the hospital? Certainly moving a fish for surgery to a hospital tank, you have a lot more control over their environment and their healing. However, a lot of these fish have, again, been in their systems, could be for years, could be for decades. And certainly if the water is clean enough, they're getting a good diet and the water is warm enough, I'm a big believer in having these fish recover in their home ponds because they're with a population of fish that they are familiar with and they are familiar with the environment. So you're not adding the stress of having to transport a fish and put it in a foreign environment. So all owners want to know prognosis. Is their investment going to pay off in the long term? Well, there's a couple different things that can influence prognosis. Obviously, prognosis is going to be decreased with poor water quality. That just should be pretty straightforward. It's going to be decreased with anorexia. Again, a fish that isn't eating because they're either very sick or there's some other problem, they're not going to have the energy to heal properly. So it's going to certainly affect their prognosis overall. And your prognosis is obviously going to be decreased over time. So the longer you wait to treat an issue, the potentially worse it could get. So I have a good example of this, is our little fish here. So this fish was actually located in Hawaii and we kind of had to put a team together in order to figure out how to get over there and take care of him. Well, we had everything loaded up, we had our plane tickets ready to go and unfortunately this poor little guy passed away. So we asked the owner, is it okay if you ship the fish to us and we'll do a necropsy and kind of get you a better idea of what was going on? Well, Unfortunately, with the necropsy, what had happened is this was essentially a tumor riding around with the fish skin. So in this case, unfortunately, we just waited too long to try to treat this guy. So next we'll cover some common surgical procedures that I see as an aquatic veterinarian. Most common one we have is a cutaneous neoplasia removal, essentially a lumpectomy. Koi and goldfish gets lots of warts and papillomas and little lumps and bumps. So again, it's not going to probably hurt the fish overall, but it, the owners don't like the look of them. Give the example of our lovely friend Mario here. Um, this is a goldfish that has some pretty invasive uh, growths there. Uh, you can't really see it too well in the picture. Let's see if I don't know. I'm sure you can see my mouse, but he can actually have um, a few. Um, additional growths here, here, and here. So unfortunately, it did make his condition a little bit more worse because he had so many of them. Um, usually with these, we'll excise them, and I like applying cryotherapy if possible because it'll get a couple layers below where we're able to excise. Again, we're going to clean the abrasion with sterile saline and betadine, and if the owners are willing, submit the lump for histopath. When trims, these are for those fancy goldfish. The hardest part about this is being able to balance the left and the right. It may take a couple dips into the anesthetic bath in order to get the left and right ratio correct. So you can see here, this little guy has quite a bit of extra tissue behind his head, and unfortunately it's covering his eye as well. So with surgery, we were able to actually trim around his eye so he could see. He was able to eat again and get up off the bottom of his tank. So unfortunately, again, this might require a couple anesthetic sessions, but I've gotten pretty good at it. The last couple have only taken one. A lot of hobbyists consider this a non-veterinary procedure, but again, you're dealing very close to dense, delicate tissues such as eyes and the gills if the operculum's involved. So it's really not recommended that a hobbyist perform this. Please call a licensed veterinarian so that the fish can receive the proper care. 
Enucleation or removing an eyeball. We have lots of different cases of ocular tumors in the patients that we see. Typically, they are koi and goldfish, um, but you can see they can vary quite a bit in appearance and severity. So immediately post-op, again, we're basically going to be taking the entire globe out, and fish don't have eyelids, so there's really nothing to close in this case. So essentially, the socket is going to be exposed to the internal environment. And again, this is where water quality is so critical. But these cases do amazingly well, and you can see our little friend Sparky here. He was the goldfish on the right. One year post-op of his procedure, you can hardly tell that there was an eye there at all. So we do a lot of enucleations, most commonly for either trauma or neoplasia for tumors. And these fish do extremely well. I promise they do just fine with one eye or no eyes. They can smell their food really well, and they have that great lateral line organ that allows them to sense the vibration of the water around them. So this is where their buddies are swimming, where the sides of their pond are, and when their owner is coming up to say the pond or the tank. Usually these guys will partner up with one little fish and it becomes their seeing eye fish. The big surgeries that we do, the open salomic surgery, which is the same as an open abdominal surgery, because fish don't have abdomens, they have a coelom, is necessary for Neoplasia removal, again, tumor removal, those gonadal sarcomas we see in koi. Foreign body removal, like our friend Rocky there. And spay or neuter procedures, which again is in a situation where the owner just can't keep up with the births or just they're having a very hard time keeping their females from getting beaten up. You can see Rocky in our little surgical setup here. We use lots of bubble wrap to keep them um, cushioned and protected. And they'll usually have a little bit of water that runs from that reservoir below up over their mouth and then down the sides of their body, keeping them moist. So this video here is going to show you an entire procedure um, of, of a salomic surgery. Just 
to rinse out all that stuff that's in there. Okay. All right, go there, please. Oh, that's all right. He lives in water. All right, great. Let's do it. So he has a name, correct? Uh, okay. Um, no, unfortunately, not. If I got in there and say, seen the ovary like last time, I was afraid it was a female, but okay, it's a little hard to tell. Join the party. How's it going? Just sewing them up. Anything else you'd like to say about your surgery? Fish dig it. Fish dig it. All right, we're going to get a quick wait and then we'll pop them right in the net. So you're ready? And go. Put a little eyeball up. All right, so we started at five pounds. He is now three pounds. That was what I said that we removed it's mostly fluid. Oh, he can go right back in there, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so he'll stay confined to the net for a while? Until yeah. he wakes back up. Okay. Will he turn himself over? Um, I actually have to take some air out of him first. Put this one for extra protection. I don't have to give him multiple shots. Right. He's full of air and can't really write himself properly. Yeah. yeah, I'm getting a bunch of air. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. It's kind of hard to get out during surgery. It's just it's kind of right. con con game on me. So hopefully you were able to see that. Um, if not, this video is available on our YouTube page, um, and I will give you the link at the very end. So with these procedures, usually the average, dura average duration of the actual procedure that I'm in there is between 30, is about 30 minutes. Um, average time for being under anesthesia, again, it's gonna be a little bit longer because we have to kind of get them up on the table. Um, is going to be about 45 minutes to an hour. So this is a relatively short amount of time. For this particular surgery and most of my salomic surgeries, I use a nylon monofilament. Um, usually there's only one layer of closure. Fish really don't have a good sub-Q layer where they can get two layers of surgery. And unfortunately, you can't use surgical glue in these guys. They tend to have a very severe inflammatory reaction. Unfortunately for this first guy, our histopathology was a little bit inconclusive. Even when we do send them to facilities that see a lot of fish tissues, unfortunately we can never get a straight answer. Um, we just need to keep sending more samples so we can get a better collection of data from this. So since they have those sutures in, we're gonna be going back to take them out about 10 to 14 days later. And you can see here, this is that koi that was in the video you just saw. And this is another one here where you have the sutures before and then after the suture removal. So for those of you who have not met Rocky, you can see him here. This is him previously uh, before surgery. During surgery, we were trying to remove all the rocks from his stomach. And fortunately, we were actually able to make this procedure shorter because while I was messing around with his stomach, they started to slide out of his mouth. So our anesthesiologist was able to pull rocks out of his mouth as I was able to take them out. So it cut our procedure time in a half. And there he is post-surgery with his lovely bag of rocks no longer floating on the bottom of his tank. So we are doing a lot more cryotherapy these days, and this is used to treat topical skin disorders. So you saw how we can use it for some of those um, lumps that are on koi and goldfish. But we see this a lot for the treatment of hikui. Now, hikui is a cutaneous neoplasia in koi. 
and we've actually had some very good results. So you can see here a fish that's receiving multiple treatments with that cryotherapy and how that lovely lesion over its saddle there is slowly going down. Keep in mind that if you've ever had a wart removed by a doctor, they tend to numb you up first. So all of the fish that require cryosurgery will receive antibiotics and pain management during those procedures. So now that the fish has had surgery, now we're going to go through what they receive for care after surgery. Immediately post-op following surgery, we want to make sure that they recover until they're able to swim on their own. I am not leaving the property until that fish is swimming normally. And again, we'll have the discussion before if the fish is going to recover at home or in the hospital. And it's going to depend on the water quality, the temperature, and the environment for that fish. Again, they're going to receive antibiotic treatment, usually, at, especially for those salomic cases, until their stitches have healed. And this is going to be dependent on the antibiotic that we choose, the temperature of the pond. Pain management, also same, same issue for these guys. You can add salt. This helps promote hema healing and um, osmoregulation across the gills. And of course, you want to make sure that you maintain an effective healing temperature. Fish are ectotherms, which means that they do not regulate their internal body temperature like other um, cats, dogs, and humans do. Their body temperature is essentially the same as the water surrounding them with a few fish cases that are um, extremes in that. So if the water is not warm, your patient will not heal well. So you have to make sure that the water is at least above 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 degrees Celsius, in order to really have them heal effectively. So looking for the short-term post-op in the weeks to months following their procedure, again, we're gonna be going back and doing that suture removal about 10 to 14 days. We want to make sure that they monitor for healing and that the fish return to their normal appetite, provided that they're fed an appropriate diet. Obviously, we're going to want to maintain water quality no matter what. So some possible complications that can arise, uh, delayed healing, especially if the water's too cold. Certainly, if you have a hospital tank on the premises, it's best if you can move the fish to a warmer water environment or else we're gonna to have to postpone the surgery until it's able to be a warmer environment. Certainly this doesn't really apply to indoor tanks. Regrowth, so again, with some of these neoplasias, there is the chance for regrowth. And again, our histopathology isn't really helping us too much with either of that right now. Obviously, we always submit a histopathology sample if possible. Infection can occur. Usually we're gonna culture it if possible. Fungus can be secondary, and usually it's going to be caused by war, poor water quality. And sometimes we see fish that we just can't explain exactly what's going on. So in this picture on the right, you can obviously see that there's a big tumor right there on the belly. However, that big liquid pocket that's above it is actually a completely liquefied ovary. And we don't know why this happened. We don't know how this happened. We took a sample of that solution. It was completely sterile. So again, the behavior of these tumors, it's something that is not studied very well at this point. Certainly we're hoping that our work here can contribute to future fish surgeons down the line and how they keep their patients healthy. But again, we have some cases just like in people and cats and dogs that we just aren't sure about at this point. So if any of you have any other uh, detailed questions, there's a bunch of articles here. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to go ahead and put that in their tiny box there. There are a bunch more surgical videos on YouTube. Um, we have it available as um, Dr. Jesse Sanders online. Um, for those of you who are veterinarians, this is one of our few programs that is available for veterinary CE. So if you want to write down that link there, I'll keep it up for another minute. Um, it's only going to be open until the end of the month, so you have about two weeks to complete the survey, but you will receive CE credit for the hour that you sat through today. 
So I will now take any questions that you have. Um, again, I unfortunately have a very tiny box on my end, so I will try to um, read them as thoroughly as I can. Okay. So the first question is about the rinse that I used. Um, during, during the Salomic surgery, we used a rinse solution to just kind of rinse out the abdomen between, um, uh, before I went ahead and sutured it up. So this is actually sterile saline that we, uh, manipulate the pH on using a buffer or an acid to pH correct it for the water that the fish is swimming in. So again, with most of our fish that we see, the pH is going to be a little bit higher around eight, eight and a half. Uh, most of the sterile saline is going to be just slightly above seven. So by adding a little bit of a buffer there, we were able to bring the pH up to where the fish was. Um, there's a question, do you ever have issues with dehiscence? So basically, if an incision has opened before we wanted it to. If so, how do we handle it? So. Really, we only have had issues of dehiscence um, with our lovely friend, Rocky. But in that case, it was actually a Pocostomus in his tank that decided to nibble his incision open. So we had to bring him back, and he had to stay with us for his full recovery. Another example was when we did a salomic surgery on a koi. Um, and unfortunately, I just kept going back and the sutures just weren't healing. It was all popping out. So we ended up having to re-suture her a couple times. Um, and in that case, we'd make the freshen up the edge of the incision. But in this case, it was a problem with the water temperature being too cold. So thankfully, the pond guy was there at the day and pointed out the lovely heated quarantine tub about 20 feet from where I was standing. So yes, dehiscence, again, it's kind of rare to happen. Um, but again, if this particular person who I know has questions about the suture material that we use, you have my email, go ahead and use it. Um, question about using um, emergency drugs in fish. So this um, emergency drugs is essentially you have a patient that's crashing and you need to probably stop surgery right away and wake them up. Um, I have heard of colleagues putting a drop of epinephrine on the gills to kind of get the fish up and moving or at least gilling a little bit more. I personally haven't had to use it um, for those fish that we have unfortunately lost during veterinary uh, surgical procedures. They had extremely invasive tumors that we were just in there way too long. Um, with the drugs that I use, um, full medullary collapse is exceedingly rare. Uh, the paper just came out in June of the, AVIA, the, the Journal of American Veterinary Medical Association, and they showed how safe it was for using a girl with goldfish because they were trying to euthanize the fish, and it really wasn't euthanizing them. So I myself have never had to use those drugs. Certainly, if we have a fish during the procedure that's starting to get a little bit too deep and starting to go under, we'll actually switch out our solution for completely fresh water um, and try to just revive them like that. And again, we will be ventilating for them. So it makes it a little bit easier rather than having them to try to breathe on their own. Um, question again about the Salomic uh, procedure was asking if we cut through the vent at all. So the vent, again, is going to be the path where a fish produces feces and urine. Absolutely not. I am never going to be cutting into a fish's vent. Um, sometimes we have to go through the um, pelvic fin girdle in the case of larger tumors. However, with this fish, we were absolutely nowhere near its vent. I was probably at least about an inch away from it. Because again, you're going to get intestines associated with that that you want to make sure that stay away from your your instruments. So the next question is about um, post-op antibiotics. Um, do they need injections every day? Do they? How do they get their post-op medications? So again, it's going to depend on um, the fish itself. If you've done any cultures beforehand, 
um, the temperature of the water is really going to dictate how fast they metabolize different drugs. So again, since it's over 60, they're usually be going through their drugs pretty quickly. Um, their initial dose should get them over at least two to three days. And then even if they're eating, we can put a uh, medication into their food and then they'll go ahead and eat that and receive their drugs that way. If not, they will require to have, um, additional um, injections and it depends on the owner and the veterinarian and their relationship and how they're going to handle that. Um, most common antibiotics I use, unfortunately, um, I see a lot of antibiotic resistance, especially in those larger expensive koi. So we'll do a um, just a quick culture and panel, especially if we have any fish in the pond who have shown previous ulcers or any other issues, and certainly we want to make sure that they're not resistant to any drugs. Um, and again, it's really going to vary on the pond and the fish that I'm seeing at the time. There's many different ones I could potentially use. I don't, I don't really have a common one that I use. Next question, um, do you think blood tests are informative in diagnosing fish disease? Um, unfortunately, not really. Um, they can help in fish to kind of establish trends. You can take a pre and post op uh, hemoglobin uh, reading and see how much blood that fish has lost. And certainly you want to make sure it goes back to normal over time. Unfortunately, the reference ranges for fish, especially some of the odd species, are not well established. So other than this giving you some trends, it's not really going to give you a whole bunch of helpful information. Um, I wish that wasn't the case. Certainly, if I had the chance to do pre and post blood work on my patients, I would. Unfortunately, I just don't think any of the information that I get from those studies is really going to help me overall. Certainly, we can do hematocrit readings. Those are very simple. You basically need to take just a little vial full of blood, put it in a centrifuge, spin it down, and you can see how much um, of your blood cells have lost during surgery. All right, lots of good questions. Um, pain meds do I use? I do not have a DEA license, so I am stuck to the non-DEA ones. I mostly use uh, Medicam and Carprofen. Um, all right, lots of good questions. So that's I'll give you one more minute. Anything else that people are interested in? Um, I know this is a very interesting topic. Hopefully you were able to get a lot out of it today. Um, certainly check out. We have other videos on our YouTube page of different procedures. You can watch an enucleation done um, and you can. Uh, what else do we have on there? Oh, it's been a while since I looked. We have a wen trim up there. Um, and we have another Salomic procedure in there. So certainly if you have more questions, go ahead and check those videos out. And thank you very much to everyone who joined us today. This recording will be up on our YouTube page for anyone who missed it. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you were able to learn a lot. Have a great afternoon and evening.